Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Mike Sowers. Mike went from remodeling and flipping houses to doing much larger commercial deals. Now he's CEO of Commercial Investors Group. He has been involved in over $150 million in deals and is the author of the Amazon number one best-selling book, Commercial Real Estate Investing, that gives a step-by-step roadmap for first-time investors to do their first big commercial deal. Uh, Mike, it's just, it was a great interview. I know you are going to enjoy it. He just blows some myths out of the water that uh, you probably are believing potentially right now as you are, you know, thinking that, hey, I don't, I don't think I can probably do commercial real estate or it's going to, I don't have enough money or what are, you know, those things that are holding you back. He's going to lay many of those out and show you why those are not uh, correct. They're not true. Uh, how he had a mentor and coach and, and uh, how coaching can, can just help you streamline the process. But he also lays out a secret of how he started growing his investor base very quickly. Uh, it's very interesting. I don't think I've heard anyone else on the show talk about growing your investor base with this method. So I know you are going to enjoy the show. Have a blessed day. Mike, welcome to the show. I know you, I mean, you went from remodeling and flipping houses to doing large commercial deals. And I know that's, that's many of our listeners as well. Uh, you know, they are they're trying to make that transition into either real estate period, you know, from maybe a job, but many of them also have been doing flips or remodeling something in real estate wholesaling, but they're and they, they see that the thing out there, you know, called commercial real estate, right. Uh, or syndication. And they're trying to make that transition and, and uh, start that business. And you have done that. I look forward to getting uh, into your story. Give us a little bit more about that. Maybe going from, uh, you know, just even the mindset or, or the process of learning how to go from, you know, say the, the flipping homes to commercial, commercial real estate and the confidence to, Hey, go make that happen. Sure. Well, it was, uh, it was kind of a rough transition. Um, you know, I, like most people believed kind of the three myths of commercial real estate, one that, uh, that you need to have really, really big corporate connections in order to, to get into the game, to fill spaces Two that you needed, you know, millions, if not hundreds of thousands, uh, for the down payment. So most people look at their checking account balance and say, well, I'll get there someday, but I got to do these other steps first before I jump into it. Um, and the third thing is that it's really, really difficult to figure out uh, how much you can pay for these deals. And so those are all the things that really held me back. And I just kind of did what I knew how to do. I ran a franchise for college pro painters for two years while I was in college um, after a summer of selling books. And I, I did quite well because I was willing to go out and door knock and generate business that way. And then I got into, um, I started my own company, uh, my senior year in college and I was doing storm damage restoration. So like repairing roofs and siding and stuff. And that business is absolutely insane. The insurance restoration business is, is a pretty cool business. And I scaled that up, had a little over 50 employees at one point. And then I scaled back down and just kind of, uh, honestly, I got burned out. I was kind of doing that full time during the day. And then I was flipping houses, wholesaling, and I, I was growing a portfolio of single family properties, but I never really figured out how to put great property management systems in place. And I just kind of got really burned out with deadbeat tenants. And I remember one Saturday I was filling in for a subcontractor who didn't do what he said he was going to do. Right. We all know that, uh, that, that skilled labor is, is a challenge, right? The joys of project management. And uh, I was filling in for a crew and I'm over here shooting finish nails and cocking this lady's cabinets on a Saturday while all my friends were out on the lake. And she was just sitting there in the living room, drinking a lemonade and just micromanaging every move that I was making. And I was like, this is not really the, the vision I had for, for my business. So I kind of mentally made a decision at that time that it was time to, to hang it up and find something new. So me and my wife were looking at condos in Florida and I got a call from a business broker and he's like, dude, I think I can sell your business for this. And I was like, you're out of your mind. 
that's nobody's ever going to buy a business. I am the entire business. At least I thought I was, but lucky for me, I had built a custom software that allowed other people to estimate the cost of repairs very quickly. And, um, with that, I listed that business and, and got a little bit of money for that and kind of was looking at what's, you know, what's going to happen in my next life here. So I was like, well, I, I love real estate. I know that's the way I want to make my wealth. I made that decision at a fairly young age. And so then I was like, well, maybe I finally have the money to, to start doing commercial deals. So I found, uh, I found some people to kind of mentor me and I, I started doing commercial deals and, um, and then I ran out of money real quick. <laughs> and I figured out how to raise capital from other people, which I think in my opinion is the most important, but probably the hardest skill to learn in commercial real estate investing. It's really the skill that house flippers and people in the residential game never really had to learn because there's so many people doing hard money loans and the down payments are such a small amount. It's, it's fairly easy to, to, to scrape up the change. But when you go do a $3 million deal and you got to come up with a million bucks, you know, very few people have that kind of cash sitting around. So really uncovering that secret of how to structure a partnership, how do you raise capital? How do you go from having a zero network of people with cash to having people kick your door down to try and give you money. That was really the game changer. And, um, you know, I think people, people look at people that do really well in, in apartment syndication and things like that. And they think that they have some kind of special gift. And the reality is they probably had a lot of sleepless nights and they had a lot of really tough transitions. I mean, I got denied by 10 banks and it took me like six months to raise $500,000 on my first redevelopment deal. And I got my teeth kicked in. There were so many times I thought about quitting. And so my number one advice is, is just uh, where there's a will, there's a way. And, okay. and to, to the newbies, just really inspiring you that, um, it's probably not going to be as easy as everybody makes it out to be. But if you follow a system and you never quit, you can see success and it gets easier. It's kind of like having your first baby, right? You're like, Oh my gosh, I'm going 10 miles an hour in the, you know, in the slow lane on my ride home. I'm super afraid that it's, you're not going to survive the first night and, and uh, every little sound that it makes, I'm, I'm going crazy. But after your first baby kind of goes and your second one comes along. You're like, you know what? I learned some things and it's not quite as tough. And you start figuring out deals are the same way. Raising capital is the same way. And really 90% of the learning just can't happen in a seminar. It can't happen by listening to a podcast. You know, people are like, how do I learn this game? I'm like, go do a deal and lose $20,000. You're going to learn a lot of things on that deal. Think of it as a college education. Obviously I don't want you to lose money, but so many people have the mindset of fear of taking action and actually pulling the trigger on something. I remember I literally could not eat at my first dinner the night after I got a big property under contract. Cause I was so afraid that I was going to lose everything I had built. Wow. Hey, you know, it's interesting. You started, uh, you started just then even with, you know what I used to believe those myths, right? Uh, all those myths and you listed three myths. And one of those specifically was no money or that you had to have a large amount of money to get started in commercial real estate. And, you, and then, you know, you sold that business and then you, you had some money and that, I think that g- what gave you some probably encouragement, right? Or you thought, okay, I, I can do this now. Then you also, you figured out again, Hey, that still wasn't the answer. Uh, and, and, you know, you mentioned like going from no network to having people knocking down your door to invest with you, right? It is a, pro- a big process. It was for me, that's for sure. Uh, with tons of work and lots of long nights like you're talking about. Uh, and, and everybody looks in right to you, looks at you and says, well, it was overnight success, right? How, how, or how did that happen, you know, so fast? But, but they don't see all that that you've been doing the last five years, 10 years, right? Uh, all that work you've been putting in, all of a sudden they see you, right? And think, oh, well, maybe it will be that easy for me too. Uh, so I appreciate you just being real about it, right? Uh, that is going, it's possible you're going to lose $20,000, right? Uh, but if you look at that as an education, man, you are going to learn a lot. I hope you don't. I, like you said, I hope the listener does not lose that much money. And you, you also mentioned uh, you found mentors, um, you know, before starting to raise money. I, I want to dive into that, though, a little bit and how you developed that pro- or how you went from no network 
to uh, you know having people knocking down your door to invest with you. I know the listeners have heard my story about how we did that, uh, but go back a little bit more. You found mentors. Was that something that helped you to move forward in commercial real estate and start to raise money? Uh, but then let's let's dive into that a little bit. Yeah. Um, look, there's a difference between a mentor and a coach, right? And if you have the wherewithal to, to commit to a coaching program, I honestly, I think it's, it's the best decision you can ever make because what I find absolutely baffling is that like I dropped probably 60 grand on a four year education and I got some great general skills, but I didn't get specific skills on how to go make money with a four year basic like bachelor of science degree. You know, there's some really, really good coaching programs that are out there for apartment syndicators and things like that. Like if you have the wherewithal to join a coaching program, the two, I think, key pieces of that that are really going to help you get to your destination faster, or like having a deal coach, somebody you can really bounce your specific deal stuff off and then an accountability coach. Now you may be able to find somebody in a quote unquote mentorship role who would do that for free. But the reality is we're all human, right? Nobody's going to dedicate a significant amount of energy and time into you for free. So you have to be willing to make an investment in them and their business in exchange to getting them to make an investment in you and your business for your time. And that's where, you know, mentors are great. If you're looking for like a hoorah once a month, kind of, Hey, how are things going? But if you really want to like have somebody to bounce your deals off and stuff, you need to go find a coach. And there's tons of the coaches out there. Just look at anybody who's doing massive success in their area. And the two things a coach is really going to give you is systems and strategy and having a really proven strategy and a good system to implement that strategy and execute on it. I think is just going to drastically reduce your learning curve. It's like, Hey, you can be bare feet, start New York. And if you keep walking West, you're eventually going to make it to the Pacific ocean, but you're going to have some bloody feet by the time you get there. You know, you go hire a mentor. That's the equivalent of like maybe hopping on a bus. But if you go get a coach, a really good coach, you can probably get in a plane and get there uh, pretty quick. You mentioned earlier, you know, like if you follow a system and never quit, Right, you're eventually going to have success. It uh, doesn't mean you're not going to get knocked down a few times. Uh, and so I appreciate that. I mean, right? I mean, having a coach, having a mentor. Yeah, I just could not agree with that more. Uh, definitely some some things there you need to consider when hiring that coach and mentor. But how did you do that, Mike? How did you? You know, what were some steps that you took to now? You know, having investors wanting to invest with you, right? Going from that, you know, you talked about struggling to raise that half a million dollars, right? Took months. Uh, but yep. now, you know, that is a little different now, right? You know, with more experience, more time in the business, more more uh, exposure to your investors, more touches, right? You know, positive touches uh, with your investors. Uh, walk us through that a little bit, how you did that. Sure. Well, one pro tip I would have is if you have some cash and you have deal flow coming in, you can partner with another active like deal sponsor. And in a way that kind of become your coach through that deal and be willing to give up, you know, most of the deal to them and look at it more like early on in your investing career. I think you really ought to be focused on how much you're learning rather than how much you're earning because people that focus on hogging their deals and never partnering or giving up equity or whatever, they miss these opportunities to partner with people that are really, really smart and can kind of walk them through. And as I mentioned or alluded to, previously, a big part of your learning comes when you actually go to raise the capital and get the debt and go through the underwriting process, which is a very time consuming, grueling process if done well. And that's why a lot of people, I think, do a, you know, a less than thorough due diligence, I'll say, right? They don't do the really nitty gritty things because the way we're wired as humans is to seek confirming evidence rather than seek disconfirming evidence. And the reality is um, you have to adopt a mindset of humility and trying to get other people to point out your blind spot. And that's the way that you reduce short-term risk for not only yourself, but your lender and your investors. And you have a fiduciary duty 
to those investors to be as thorough as possible. And the reality is I've canceled deals and had a stomach ache about it. I've left, I think like 40 or 50,000 in due diligence money on the table before. And it hurts, but I know that going through with the deal would have hurt even more and making those tough decisions. And the way we do it is when I lose money and I cancel a deal, I eat a hundred percent of those costs. I do not pass those through to my investors. This is my business. It's my responsibility. Um, so the investors in our group uh, are never at risk until we close on a property. And, you know, I sign off saying that I've done it and we actually have a process, right? So we have a very, very detailed due diligence process that I feel really, really good about. Love that. I love that. I mean, you take the responsibility, right? It reminds me of that book, Extreme Ownership, right? I mean, you are the leader in that business and even through the due diligence process and every communication with your investors, no matter if it's somebody else on the team doing it. Uh, and I like to think that way as well. I've had, you know, investors be upset about something, right? You know, with somebody, it's something that someone on the team did. And I just, you know, they copy me on an email grapping about it. I'm just, I just try to immediately respond and say, Hey, I'm sorry. This is, you know, my, my fault that this happened. This is what we're going to do to, to fix this. Right. Yeah. Uh, that ownership. So, uh, yeah. So I just appreciate you expressing that as well. Uh, you know, and, and even the, you know, I, I made a note of it early on, you know, focus on how much you're learning versus how much you're earning. And that's hard, right? Because you you feel like you're starting with almost no money. Oftentimes, you know, people that are getting into this business uh, and you see these other guys who, are, who seem to be making so much money, but they didn't start there, right? They did not start there. Uh, and, and I just, I think that's so crucial. Focus on the learning piece. I also try to tell people the same thing. It's like, man, you know, just by getting in and being able to partner on that project, if you don't make a penny, you have earned so much just by the learning, uh, you know. Uh, and so, so you you dove in. You see, maybe you partnered. With, did you partner? With yeah. Somebody? So did I partnered you? with somebody on my first project, and I learned a ton from the guy. Uh, great guy. And we, you know, uh, kind of outgrew our relationship, and and uh, we're still both doing deals, and you know, separately. And every project that comes along is kind of a separate partnership. And, you know, at the end of the day, you learn a lot when you're going through the deals and especially if you're partnering with somebody who has done it before. So that's kind of a, a third alternative, but to get there, you have to have deal flow and to get deal flow, you, you really need to look beyond the traditional methods. Most people getting started, look at everything listed online. If you're anything like me, it's like running around like a chicken with your head cut off. You're literally looking at everything. And the reality is, um, if you don't know how to analyze a deal, it, it, it's really tough. You can spend like days in a spreadsheet analysis tool or Argus or whatever, analyzing a deal, trying to figure out how much it's worth and how much you should pay for it. And the lack of confidence in your ability to analyze the deal translates to fear and usually indecision and lack of being able to ever get anything under contract. Because when you're presenting your offers, you're so afraid that you're overpaying for the property or you're so far off on your analysis that you're not even in the ballpark of what you should be paying in order to get that deal accepted. And so it all starts with, um, with being able to analyze a deal. And then it starts with having a robust, I think, direct marketing and broker channel network to really be able to source off-market deals because I always make this joke. People are like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm looking at LoopNet every day. I'm like, great, that's where deals go to die. Rarely are there deals on LoopNet that make sense for me because if it's, if it's represented by a professional broker, then it's at market price. And there's usually pretty good brokers in the commercial real estate game. They tend to be very sharp, um, even though they never return phone calls. <laughs> It's my pet peeve of the industry. Uh, commercial real estate brokers are uh, not traditionally uh, great at customer service, but uh, that's, a, that's an aside that I'm just throwing out there. So if you're getting started and you're calling on listings and nobody's calling you back, don't worry, it's not you, it's them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you partnered though. How did, what were the next couple of things that helped you to build this, this group or base of investors where now hey, you can raise you know, plenty of, of capital for your deals? I did a, a crowdfund on my first deal. So I did, I, I did a crowdfund and, and so I was able to openly market it. It was the first mixed use crowdfund here in Minnesota. And like I said, it was tough. You know, you're, you're under this mindset that if you got a good deal, the money's just going to come and it couldn't be farther from the truth. 
And the reality is, uh, you know, you're like, oh, well, I got a crowdfund. I'm going to put it on Facebook. And who with 25 or 50 grand in their IRA wouldn't want to invest in something like this? And the reality is it's, it's nothing like that. And you got to grind and you got to figure out some systems. And then I uncovered a secret that changed my investing for good. With this secret, I literally went from being able to raise $500,000 in six months to being able to raise $500,000 with one phone call. Now we're able to raise multi-millions using this one secret. And that secret is how to build an investor's list of people you've never met before. And here's how it works. Part of your direct marketing strategy is calling property owners to see if they're willing to sell you their building. That's our number one way for generating deals is the old fashioned pick up the phone and call people. Now you got to remember most property owners in commercial real estate are 60 years old or older, not all, but in general, the middle of the bell curve is like 60 to 80. These people generally, um, will respond better to like a piece of mail or a phone call than they will to some of these other, you know, paid ads on Facebook kind of stuff. Right. So we just do the old fashioned, maybe send them a, a letter or a postcard or something and follow up with a phone call. And we tend to get pretty good results with that. And what'll happen is uh, more often than not, the property is working out really great for them. And so I'll just transition them. I'm super glad to hear. It sounds like you're a fantastic operator. Uh, maybe somebody we would consider partnering with. Now, as you know, I'm marketing to other property owners the same way I marketed to you, Bill. And I get a lot of off-market opportunities. Um, next time I get one under contract, uh, would you want to, me to reach out and at least run it by you? And he'll say yes or no. I'll grab his information if it's a yes. I put him on the list either way. <laughs> And then when I have an opportunity under contract, that's my list of people I invite for my webinar. And then I do a webinar where I pitch it. And then I have a follow-up sales process. I do a really nice, you know, PowerPoint or whatever, I guess Google slides these days, Google's taken over. Um, and that's pretty much it. So it's being able to convert your nose when you're prospecting for deal flow into potential investors. And with that secret, you basically have an unlimited, I mean, who better to invest in your deals than somebody that already owns and understands commercial real estate and is doing well cash flowing on their property. Or a lot of times you're, you're calling on people that are uh, owner occupants, they're running a business and they just happen to own the, the real estate that they're in. And those people, if they're generating additional cash flow, are high income earning people that are great candidates for passive uh, limited partners because they get all the big depreciation benefits. Cause we generally buy for long-term holds and we'll cost segregate. So for every, you know, 500,000 they put in, they might get three or $400,000 in write off in year one. That's incredible. No, that's a, or, or you find a project that's for sale, right? Either they're going to sell their project or, or maybe both. They become an investor. Two quick questions about that before we have to move on. Um, finding that list. How do you build that list? And, and you know, I mean, get a qualified list to target. Uh, most major metropolitans have their parcel data in spreadsheet format. So you got to call the county assessor's office or the recorder's office. It depends on which part of the country you're in. And you can usually get your hands on that spreadsheet. Once you have the spreadsheet, then you need a reputable company that can find the like registered agents or the named managers of the LLCs or S corps or whoever, whatever entity owns the property. Don't go to one of these traditional skip tracing firms that specializes in residential because you can't skip trace an LLC and really get that great of data. What you have to do is find like who's the real owner behind the LLC and then skip trace them. Skip tracing is just like getting somebody's cell phone and email. So there's a, you can find a third party that will do that for entities or LLCs for you. Yeah. It took me two years to find a really good vendor that, that does this process. And there's really no great way to automate it. So most of the skip tracing companies out there have a database and they do it just through technology. It, you, you really can't do it effectively and get a really good hit rate uh, that way. So you need to have a company that's literally going to manually go record by record and go do some uh, data mining to find the named manager. We created a bot to do it for our County, but then we started franchising nationwide and I would have had to re build that bot for every single franchise we sold. So I was like, well, this is not scalable. So we ended up going and finding a vendor to do that for us. And now that service is available for our franchisees. 
Nice. What, what about a, do you have a conversion goal for investors that way or, you know, like per week or month or something? What should the listener expect or something they could, a target they could shoot for by using that method? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I, I love looking at uh, like conversion ratios and things like that. Typically what you could expect is if, if you call a hundred property owners, you maybe are going to schedule one tour uh, maybe two tours. And out of that, I might get like 10 to 20 people as potentials on my list. And then from that, if I do a webinar and I have a hundred people on there, um, I might get an average subscription of a hundred thousand dollars, maybe $50,000 per person. Um, depending on the offering, some of my offerings, I only, uh, invite like higher ticket people where we don't want as many investors, maybe 250 plus or, or 500 K as kind of the, the target average. And those are generally my repeat investors. We have a lot of our investors invest with us over and over. Michael, so I, what? you know, the conversion there, there's just so many metrics that go into how much you're going to actually convert on a webinar. It depends sure. on your project. Are you doing a single asset or a multi-asset? I'd just be throwing out some numbers because it's different on every single deal. So 68% of statistics are made up on the spot, including this one. <laughs> what would you have done different on your first project? Or would or you, would you, not so much the flipping and some of that, but would you have started in the commercial real estate space right from the beginning? Or how would you have changed your career path? Or would you have? I, I would have. Now? I would have for sure. Because had somebody shattered those myths for me 10 years ago, I would have got started. Like if you're in your twenties or thirties and you're just wanting to get started and you have no experience, just, just abandon the idea of the sexy HGTV house flip. Like just, just, just to eliminate that right now, set your mind on success in commercial. You're going to probably make way less money for your first year or two, but you're going to have this really high hyperbolic curve because the key is learning how to raise capital from other people. And once you've mastered that skill, you can literally do an unlimited number of deals where if you get in this mindset of like, I'm going to save up 20 grand and flip one house and have a rental. Look, I don't know about you, but, but having a rental and cash flow on 200, 300, maybe 500 bucks a month just doesn't get me excited anymore. Now, if you're getting started in your house hacking or whatever, that's a, you know, a great way to kind of get your toes wet, but maybe do a deal or two just to kind of understand how to deal with contractors, whatever, work out some of the kinks, but the reality is there's a lot of 500 or $700,000 little commercial buildings out there that you can get the same learning lesson on. And the difference is very few people who are beginning go after commercial. So the competition tends to be, um, a little bit less severe unless, I mean, in the apartment game, everybody, you know, that's kind of the sexy product everybody wants to go after. And it's one of the reasons, I mean, I, we love apartments, but also I don't love bidding against 20 other people for a project either. I'm never going to get into situations where, where I'm in like an auction type scenario. Yeah. I just, I, I just don't enjoy that. Even if I can still get it at a good deal, I just don't enjoy it. I love being, the only person making an offer. So we focus on properties that still have really high demand, like small Bay warehouse, suburban class C office properties that are kind of have some vacancy and renovation issues. We teach it in, in my book that I came out with, um, in July, the value add strategy, I guess it's called, it's been around forever. Right. And it's no different than flipping a house, right? You're buying an ugly house. The difference is in a house, most cases you're renovating it and then selling it to like an owner occupant. In this case, we're usually renovating a multi-tenant building, filling it up with tenants, and then selling it to like a financial buyer for a multiple of its income. Mike, you know, just with our market that we're in right now in real estate, no matter if it's industrial, multifamily, whatever, uh, you know, how do you prepare for a downturn or how do you, you know, even coach others or tell others, hey, you should, you know, be prepared, you know, for the next six to 12 months, kind of what, what do you expect and how do you, how are you prepared for that as you're moving into new projects? Yeah, that's great. Um, two things. One, I think you need to understand where you're at on the market cycle so that you can analyze deals effectively. So what you should be focused on is not trying to time the market. You should be focused on finding the right deal to invest in, not the right time to invest. Now, the right deal is a deal where you can create significant equity by driving up the underlying income stream and the multiple of that income that the market would buy the property for. 
And that's really the value add strategy. I think it's the strategy of only focusing on properties where you're creating tremendous value. That is really the risk mitigation strategy because what happens is let's say you're all in on a building for $1 million. You bought it for 800, you put 200 into renovation and leasing. Now you're in for a million. If it's worth a million four and the market metrics change, let's say rent rates go down or vacancy goes up or cap rates change. And maybe that building's worth 1.2 now. You've only eaten into equity you created, not capital you contributed. And so therefore that strategy is really the best long-term risk mitigation strategy is only doing deals where you're creating significant value. Short-term risk comes from blowing it on the execution of the business plan on these types of projects. And that's really your fix, fill, and financial steps, steps four through six of my seven steps to freedom that I teach in the book. And that's renovation problems, like either your contractor screws up, you miss line items, you underbid certain aspects of it, or you went way over on your timeline. So your holding costs were way higher than you thought they would be. Or maybe you didn't lease it up to the occupancy you thought you were going to get. Or maybe you thought you were going to increase rents on those two-bedroom apartments by 300 a month, but the market really only is going to bear 100 a month. Or to get the 300 a month, you're only at 80% occupancy instead of the 90% you thought, because there's that trade-off between occupancy and price. And then the third piece is the property management piece, is being really smart and deliberate about the types of leases you're putting in place and then getting a really good third-party property management company where you can structure their compensation to incentivize them and then have like an asset management tracking system with regular reporting to really incentivize them to drive the value of the property by driving the underlying NOI. And so those are all the key pieces. Really, that's a systems thing. So the long-term risk is mitigated by strategy. The short-term risk is mitigated by systems. That's incredible. I, I hope the listeners will... Listen to those again. Listen to those things you just said, the steps that, that you just laid out. Man, if we could just focus on that, we could probably talk about those things just, I mean, all day today uh, and wouldn't exhaust it. Uh, but uh, great answer. But uh, quickly, uh, number one thing that's contributed to your success, Mike? Uh, God, I give all my credit to God. There's nothing that I have that wasn't given to me by a higher power. Um, you know, I kind of had a life changing experience. I really shied away from church uh, initially when I was younger, um, but I always knew there was a God and I went through some turbulent times. Uh, my mom ended up committing suicide, kind of a personal story. And uh, it, it just kind of shattered me a little bit. And I just, I found myself, um, you know, kind of walking away from myself a little bit. And it was like, I'm still doing great on the surface, but underneath in all humility, it was like, I was just kind of torn. I was not stepping into my true purpose. I was not becoming the person God had called me to be. And when I finally hit my knees and admitted that to myself and, and, um, you know, gave my life back to Christ. I, I got back into the church and, and I am the, I, I play lead electric guitar now for our worship team. And I just really, really enjoy living in a zone of humility and understanding that, you know, life is short and the best advice that I can give to anybody that would contribute to your success is give credit where credit's due. And if you find that relationship, you find your purpose and you never quit until you achieve that purpose. And for many, like my purpose has evolved. My purpose has evolved to, to help develop other people to unlock their true potential so that they can create financial freedom, buy back their time so that they can spend it doing the things that they were called to do. Mike, incredible. I appreciate you just being transparent and sharing that. Uh, I hope the listeners will listen closely to that. Also, I play drums in our our worship team. Oh, that's cool, church, man! So I'd love to get together and and play sometime and and worship together as well. So uh, that's incredible. Uh, but I just appreciate you being so transparent, sharing your story. And I mean, you know, uh, from also going from you know house flipping to that type of work to just the mindset shift to commercial real estate, and being able to raise uh, a lot more money now than you know that first project uh, for say in commercial real estate and how you did that. I mean you've provided so much value to the listeners and I today and would love to have you back sometime. I know, see, like I said, before we got started, we didn't even get to some of the points that we talked about before the show. Uh, but, uh, you know, I know you all are doing a large fund now, multi-asset fund, and also have franchised your real estate company, which is incredible. I don't think we've 
uh, you said you're the first. So obviously we've not had anyone else you know, about 1100 plus episodes. Now we've not had anyone else talk about that. So I'd love to have you back sometime into uh, soon for us to, to dive into that as well. Uh, tell the listeners though, how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you and find your book. Yeah. If you want to get in touch with me, discovery call with Mike.com. You can book a, you know, one-on-one call with me, whether you want to talk about investing passively in our fund, or you want to talk about a franchise opportunity. We also have a, a coaching program. It's not look my coaching program. We used to do for like a big ticket, like, you know, $30,000, right. For a 12 month program. Now I, I reposition that as more or less like a, a high volume. And it's really a marketing expense for us to kind of groom other people to potentially become franchisees someday. So we're literally giving it away. I actually lose money on our coaching program, uh, but that's pretty cool. You can check that out. Um, I'd like to give you a free PDF of my book uh, to your listeners, just as a way to get people started. Um, and you can grab or claim a copy of that at commercial investing slash book. And I also have a webinar where I talk about those three myths we started the show with and really help people figure out how to put a direct marketing strategy in place to generate like 30 to 50 leads a month, how to analyze a deal in 60 seconds or less, and how to raise money from other people, like literally the ins and outs of how you structure a partnership, how do you split the profits? I do all that in a free webinar. That's commercialinvestingmastery.com slash webinar. I highly recommend you guys would check that out as well. And if you stick to the end of the webinar, I actually give you an audio book version. If you like to listen on the fly, that's just kind of a bonus for people for checking that out in compensation for your time. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.